If you're really anti-establishment, you should be extremely suspicious of any technology that claims to be all about decentralization and taking power out of the hands of institutions, and yet is backed by the very individuals who corrupted those institutions in the first place. Oh my god, am I tired of thinking about NFTs. What is up guys, welcome back to my channel. In today's video, I'm going to talk to you about NFTs, again. <laughs> In last week's video, I talked about NFTs. I talked about what they are, what gives them value, how you make them, the benefits that the NFT community can have for artists, and some of the drawbacks and why I think that a lot of NFTs are just a get-rich-quick scheme. In this video, I'm going to build off of concepts that I talked about in my first video. So if you haven't seen the first video, go watch that first because this is part two. I'm going to go further into depth about what is blockchain, what is Ethereum, the environmental impact of NFTs, proof of work, proof of stake, Tezos, which is a blockchain alternative to Ethereum that allows you to implement NFTs, and finally some closing thoughts on other dumb stuff related to crypto that didn't fit nicely in this video, so stay tuned for that at the end. This video is geared towards photographers specifically, but the information in it would be helpful to anyone who wants more information on this topic that isn't filtered through the aggressively starry-eyed gaze of a crypto bro who's just spent his life savings on a YouTuber's Ponzi scheme. So I just wanted to make a disclaimer that I'm not a neutral voice in this, nor do I strive to be. My opinion of crypto is going to be very obvious throughout this video if it wasn't in the first video And though I do remain open to some of the alternatives that I will discuss later on I'm not by any means particularly excited about them for reasons that I will also get into The sources of this video are in the description below and I've got my video notes right here So you'll see me glancing over occasionally and that's when I'm checking my notes So with all of that said, let's get right into it and let's talk about blockchain What is blockchain? Blockchain is a distributed ledger that is open to everybody who has a copy of it. Once data has been recorded inside the blockchain, it is incredibly difficult to remove it. And actually it's virtually impossible <laughs> to remove it. The technology was originally developed in 1991 as a way of preventing people from forging or backdating digital documents. But it went relatively unused until 2009 when Satoshi Nakamoto, a figure who is known only by name and has absolutely no public facing identity, used the technology to create the cryptocurrency Bitcoin. Bitcoin's blockchain is very straightforward. Each block contains three elements, data, the hash of the block, and the hash of the block before it. The data that is stored in the block depends on the blockchain. In Bitcoin's case, it's just got the details of transactions. So the sender, the receiver, and the amount of currency involved. And blocks can have more than one transaction. They can have many transactions in each block. The hash of the block is a random sequence of letters and numbers. And it's very similar to a fingerprint in that it is unique and it is used to identify that specific block. There are no two blocks with the same hash. And the hash identifies the block and all of its contents. And that's an important piece. The key element here is that in addition to the hash of the block and the data, each block also contains the hash of the block before it. And this creates a chain linking each block to the one before it. Changing the data inside the block will also change the hash of the block, which will make all blocks pointing back to it invalid. So you got the next block points back to this one. Well, this one's hash has changed. That means the hash in this one is now wrong. This block is invalid. Because this block is invalid, it means all succeeding blocks are invalid. So if you wanted to forge data on the blockchain, you would need to recalculate the hashes of all succeeding blocks with the new hash in order to make the chain valid again. Now this sounds like it would be a lot of work, but it actually wouldn't be because computers are very fast nowadays and can calculate thousands of hashes in an instant. So what prevents people from just forging blocks all over the place and then recalculating the entire chain to make it valid again? Well, to prevent this, blockchains employ a system called proof of work. And this is probably the most hated aspect of cryptocurrency. At least it's my most hated aspect of uh, Proof of work is a mechanism that artificially slows down the creation of new blocks by creating a computational puzzle that needs to be solved before that block can be recalculated. In Bitcoin's case, it takes about 10 minutes to solve that puzzle. In Ethereum's case, it's closer to 14 seconds. This means that nobody can just speed run their way through recalculating the entire chain because each block is gonna take you 14 seconds. And in Ethereum's chain, there's 14 million blocks. So that's gonna be about six years worth of seconds. Now that sounds like a lot, but it's still feasible that you could spend six years of computing power to recalculate all of the blocks in the chain. So <laughs> there's a third security mechanism that prevents people from doing this. And that is that it is distributed. Everybody who engages with the blockchain has their own copy of the blockchain. 
And so you wouldn't just have to recalculate your own chain, you'd have to recalculate the blocks on everybody's chain. And with hundreds of thousands, if not millions of users, that actually would be basically impossible. When a new block is created, it's sent to every other copy of the chain to be validated. And from here on out, I'm gonna call copies of the chain nodes. So a node is basically a computer or a group of computers that is engaged with the blockchain. It's on the network. So if over 50% of the nodes agree that a block is valid, then it is validated and added to the chain. So remember there's a computational puzzle that's being solved? Well, the first person, the first node to solve this computational puzzle is rewarded with a portion of the chain's currency. So in Ethereum's case, that currency is Ether. So they will take home a little bit of Ether as well as the fees associated with the transactions inside that block. So you have to pay all these fees, minting, listing, settlement, whatever fees, those go into the block and they are used to reward the person who solved the computational puzzle necessary to add that block to the blockchain. Because solving that computational puzzle takes computer energy and that energy costs money. If you weren't rewarded for engaging with the chain as a validator and solving the computational puzzle, then nobody would really want to do it because you'd just be burning energy for no reason. It takes energy to solve that puzzle. You're paying for that energy and if you're not going to get anything out of it, you're not going to do it. <laughs> Put a pin in that because we're going to talk about energy later on. So to recap, blockchains contain blocks that are linked together in ways that make them difficult to forge, require a computational puzzle to be solved each time a new block is created. The chain itself is not stored in any one place on any one server, but rather it's distributed among a network of users. And this is all true of both Ethereum and Bitcoin. So why aren't NFTs made with Bitcoin? <laughs> well, let's talk about Ethereum. What is Ethereum? Well, Ethereum is the blockchain which the majority of NFTs are minted on. Like Bitcoin, it uses proof of work to validate its blocks, which I will talk more about later. But unlike Bitcoin, it allows for the creation of smart contracts. Smart contracts are basically small computer programs that are embedded within the blockchain. So it can be like an if then kind of thing. Something as simple as if I give you X amount of money, then you give me Z product. But it can also be more complicated like, if I give you X money and Y other people give you X money, then you give us all Z product. The terms of that transaction are codified on the blockchain indelibly. There's no way that I can send you money and not get my product because the mechanism that enables the transaction is coded indelibly on the blockchain. So crypto enthusiasts really love this feature <laughs> because it means you no longer have to put trust in certain institutions to guarantee that the terms of a transaction are fulfilled. The terms of the transaction are guaranteed simply by engaging with the transaction on the blockchain. This I think is kind of misunderstanding the problem and I don't wanna to go too far in depth on this, but I distrust mainstream financial institutions because I don't trust what they're doing with my money outside of the terms of our agreed to transactions. It's not because I don't think that they're going to fulfill the terms of those transactions, you know? I don't think that the problem with big banks is that they're constantly breaking contracts with their users. The problem that I see with big banks is that they take the money that their users have deposited and they then invest that in planet destroying industries like big oil. And that's not something that smart contracts can insure against. And also that's why I switched to a credit union. So screw you, BMO. I digress. <laughs> Smart contracts have been used for a lot of proof of concept works outside of finance, but none of them seem to me to be extremely practical, at least not yet. And for reasons completely unrelated to trust in banks, etc. No, I mean, applications for smart contracts that take advantage of the indelible nature of things that are coded on the blockchain tend to suffer from the fact that that information is publicly available. So things like storing medical records, real estate holdings, or energy documents. I, I can't imagine why you would ever want those things to be public, especially if you're like a real estate tycoon or something like that, or your medical records. Why would you want those things to be public? And then on the other hand, applications that benefit from the public accessibility of blockchain are hurt by the indelible nature of the information coded on it. So something like a social network, <laughs> you know, there's Odyssey, which is a, a YouTube-like video streaming platform. You can't take posts down once they've been uploaded. And so of course, it's immediately going to be overrun by hate speech and illegal material. And because it's a blockchain, it's essentially being downloaded onto the computers of all of the users. So that hateful material, which could include things like pornography, are being downloaded onto the computers of thousands of users. And that just seems like, a complete recipe for disaster. And of course, crypto bros will tell you that, oh, well, it's, you know, that's like the price we have to pay for this amazing decentralized revolution. And I don't really see the benefits outweighing the cons on that one, like at all. I don't really see the benefits 
at all, to be honest with you. And another example is games. They wanna put games up on the blockchain. Like that's cool to have that be publicly available and everything, but at the same time, you can't patch it. I mean, you can't patch the code of anything that's uploaded to the blockchain. So if there's any errors found or anything that needs to be fixed after it's put up, like too bad. <laughs> You're just gonna have to pay to burn it all and then remint it all. And like, you'll hear people talk about these things and they never really seem to mention that. You know, they'll be like, oh, there's, there's a ways to, to go, but isn't this exciting? And it's like, well, <laughs> Is it? Like having a, a machine that just automatically downloads photography onto your computer or a game that's inherently unplayable and can never be fixed. Like, I don't know. Anyways, so NFTs, <laughs> they're minted on smart contracts and they assign ownership and manage the transferability of that NFT. Ethereum was not the first blockchain to employ NFTs. In fact, the first NFT, which was made in 2014, called Quantum, was deployed on Namecoin. But out of all the smart contract blockchains, Ethereum has by far had the most success. In fact, Ethereum is one of the most successful coins, second only to Bitcoin. But as cool as smart contracts are, Ethereum does have one major drawback that I think has been the elephant in the room for this entire video and the previous one so far, and that is the environmental impact. <laughs> So Beeple, <laughs> the artist who's famous for selling that NFT for $69 million at Christie's Auction House and kickstarting the NFT gold rush, says that he uses some of the money that he makes selling NFTs to pay for carbon offsets. He says that per collection, it costs about $5,000 to fund initiatives that will offset the carbon that's created by the minting and selling of that collection. $5,000. So think about everybody minting collections and ask yourself, are they all putting $5,000 towards tree planting and carbon sequestration? I think probably not. And who is paying for the cost of that carbon dioxide emission? I would like to think that it's the world's governments, but we all know that's not true. Nobody's paying for it, and that's why the climate is warming. $5,000 worth of damage control per collection, and that's just one artist in tens of thousands. Digiconomist estimates that the carbon footprint of a single Ethereum transaction is around 34 kilograms of carbon dioxide. <laughs> one transaction. Other estimates put it at 48 kilograms of carbon dioxide. Each time an NFT is minted or sold, that's another transaction. So if a 200 pound person mints and sells an NFT, they are creating their body weight in carbon dioxide. And that is pretty horrifying to imagine. Like the image that popped into my head was just like a shadow version of me that's completely made out of charcoal. And essentially that's what you're putting into the atmosphere. That's like just doubling your carbon footprint for the next two weeks. <laughs> Every time you mint and sell an NFT. And Ethereum isn't half as bad as Bitcoin, which takes up more energy annually than Argentina or Norway, <laughs> entire countries. <laughs> Not to say Ethereum is good though, because it takes up as much energy as Ukraine. And let's just, let's just think about that for perspective for a second. If the Ukraine announced today that they were doing this revolutionary new zero carbon, they're completely net neutral, their government has been working for decades with scientists and cross collaboration among all levels of government, and they finally managed to get a completely net zero economy, which is the golden standard that every country on the planet would eventually like to reach. They did it tomorrow. That effort would be completely undone by Ethereum alone. That's pretty bad, that's pretty bad. People will sometimes default to the argument that, oh, well, there's 100 corporations that are responsible for 70% of the world's global greenhouse gas emissions. So why bother even trying to reduce our own carbon footprints when our carbon footprints individually are a fraction of what these corporations are producing? To which I would remind them that these crypto mining operations are large corporations themselves. It's not just one guy in his bedroom with a computer anymore. It's now this. The overhead costs associated with these big crypto mining rigs go directly to companies supplying energy, and specifically big oil. Many of these big oil giants are among those hundred corporations that are producing 70% of global emissions. These corporations aren't producing these emissions in a vacuum, they're producing them in service to a consumer economy. <laughs> and NFTs are driving a share of the demand of energy that these corporations are servicing. So yeah, stricter government regulations are necessary for change and would be really, really nice. But I would argue that it is our responsibility as consumers to have some degree of conscientiousness over our decisions on what we are consuming, even if it is impossible to live a truly neutral life. I know that there's no ethical consumption under capitalism, but it's not just about the emissions themselves. It's about the signals that we send by engaging with environmentally damaging practices. We can vote at the ballot box once every four years for changes in government regulations, but we can vote every single day with our dollars, our time, and our attention. And I would argue that one 
one of those forms of voting has a much bigger impact than the other on the behavior of these planet-destroying corporations. So with all of that said, <laughs> why? Why is blockchain so bad for the environment? <laughs> like, how can that be and how can that be solved? What is the alternative for artists who want to make NFTs but don't want to make a life-sized human cutout of themselves made out of carbon dioxide? Well, to answer that, we will have to talk about proof of work and proof of stake. To use the term puzzle to describe what computers are solving when they engage in a proof of work system is a bit misleading. The answer cannot really be computed so much as guessed at. Brute forcing that answer, solving that puzzle, is making a series of systematized guesses, not working out an answer based on clues as with a traditional puzzle. Once the correct sequence is found, however, it is very easy to verify. Think of it as like a long string of letters and numbers that needs to fit within a certain set of rules and parameters. You can't really compute what the answer would be based on those rules and parameters, but once you find the answer, you can check it against those rules and parameters, and if it fits, then you know that it's the correct answer. This is why it takes a while to solve the computational puzzle and validate the block, but it doesn't take nearly that long for every node on the blockchain to verify that that answer is correct. Mining is basically hooking up a bunch of computers and having them all work in tandem to guess at the correct solution. The more computers you have, the more guesses you have, therefore the higher the chance of you being the one to find the correct answer and thus being rewarded with the fees associated with the newly validated block and a piece of the cryptocurrency associated with it. Because more computational power equals more chance of profit, you get these massive crypto mining farms that are the size of industrial greenhouses and they produce an insane amount of heat energy and they consume an insane amount of electricity. So one of the biggest issues with proof of work is that miners are competing against each other to solve the correct answer. So once that puzzle is solved, only the person who solves it gets the reward. Everyone else whose computers put energy into finding that solution gets nothing. And so all of the energy put in by everybody else in the network is completely wasted. <laughs> so that's pretty dumb. <laughs> Don't let any crypto bro tell you that that's not dumb because that is dumb. And most people who engage with the scientific side of cryptocurrency will agree that that's a problem. Another hitch is that the answer gets harder and harder to solve the more people are engaged with the blockchain. So the amount of energy wasted increases as more people sign on to become miners. And that is a pretty huge barrier to proof of work systems being adopted on a massive scale. The energy consumption scales as more people get involved with the network. And crypto bros always want crypto to become widely adopted. And yet there's this huge, arguably physical barrier in the way. Crypto enthusiasts will tell you that this cost, this environmental cost, is a necessary evil because of all of the benefits that crypto provides, which I've talked about briefly, but which other creators on YouTube have done an excellent job of debunking, and I will provide some sources in the description below for further reading. Other crypto enthusiasts will argue that our current financial system has an environmental cost too. This would just be replacing one environmentally costly thing with another environmentally costly thing, but that doesn't really take into account the fact that one Ethereum transaction consumes the same amount of energy as like 110,000 Visa transactions. That's not remotely scalable and that is a huge, huge barrier to widespread adoption. So if crypto really is going to revolutionize the way we do internet a la web 3.0, we really need a better system. One where miners don't compete against each other in this winner takes all format. Enter proof of stake. The proof of stake uses an election process to randomly select one node to be chosen to be the validator for the next block. So instead of having everybody all try to become the validator all at once, racing each other to the goal, you just have one person randomly selected. So only one person is putting the energy in to compute that puzzle and the energy needs go down dramatically. To ensure that the node who is randomly selected is not a bad actor, they must deposit a certain amount of currency into the blockchain. Think of it like putting collateral in a vault. And this is called staking. You're putting your currency at stake. The more coins you deposit, the more you have at stake, the higher your chances of being chosen as the next validator. If I deposit 10 coins and you deposit 100, then you have a 10 times higher chance of being chosen as the next validator than I have because you have 10 times more currency at stake. With proof of work, increasing your chances of becoming the next validator requires increasing your computational power and therefore your energy consumption. But with proof of stake, you need only increase the amount of coins that you have at stake. It seems like a pretty simple solution, and I do 
much prefer this to proof of work <laughs> for obvious reasons, but there are some problems with it that I will discuss later on. But first, I wanna talk about a promising alternative to Ethereum that uses this proof of stake system, and that is Tezos. So Ethereum plans to switch over to proof of stake at some point in the future, but it keeps getting postponed and delayed, and it really, really seems like a complicated process. It's gonna take a lot more effort than a lot of crypto enthusiasts are advertising, but for now, while Ethereum is on proof of work, Tezos provides an affordable way for artists to enter the NFT marketplace without the hundreds of dollars in gas fees and the emotional and ethical baggage of creating so much carbon dioxide. Enter Tezos. So first off, a uh, big shout out to Erica Lamoth and to Kristen Ruse for sitting down with me to chat about this part of the video. They both mint NFTs on Tezos and they had a lot of great things to say about it and also provided me with a lot of great resources that helped to guide my research for this section. So Tezos solves a lot of the problems that I've touched on with Ethereum so far in both this video and the previous video and a unique artist's community has developed around it. What's great about Tezos? Well, because it operates on a proof of stake system, its carbon footprint obviously is dramatically lower than Ethereum's. As a result, the minting and gas fees associated with each transaction are also dramatically lower. The risk of entry to the NFT marketplace on Tezos is much lower as it only costs about 20 cents to mint an NFT as opposed to on Ethereum where it can be anywhere from 130 to $150. Tezos's coin is not called Tezos. It's called XTZ coin, which does seem a little crypto douchey to me, but I will give it a pass. <laughs> and it's worth around $3.80 USD, as opposed to Ethereum, which costs closer to 3,000 USD. Tezos can also process transactions much faster than Ethereum. It can process around 100 transactions a second, whereas Ethereum takes a few seconds and up to a minute to process just one. Validators on Tezos are called bakers, and there's currently around 370 bakers actively engaged in making new blocks. To get in on Tezos as a baker requires staking a minimum of 8,000 XTZ coins, which is around 30 to $40,000, which sounds like a lot. And this amount must be locked up for a minimum of 40 days before you can be a baker. You can also delegate your rights to a baker and receive a small share of their profits. And this requires no buy-in and you can get a, a small share of profits from it. So that's why there's 110,000 delegates and only 370 bakers. Tezos is superior to Ethereum in a lot of ways, but the most prominent, aside from the environmental impact, is its affordability. So Erica told me that she sells NFTs on Tezos for $10 to $15, which is a great profit for a 20 cent investment. It's also a much more reasonable price for a new artist to be charging for their work. Not that Erica's a new artist, she's fabulous and deserves all the money she can make, but somebody who's just breaking into photography and NFTs and all of that, if you don't have the social capital necessary to sell your art for $150 on Ethereum, that's okay. You can sell it for $10 on Tezos and still make a great profit. On Ethereum, you can mint an NFT for $100 and sell it for $110 while also creating your body weight in carbon dioxide. But on Tezos, you can make the same profit without all of that environmental baggage. So the downside of Tezos is that it isn't really nearly as widely adopted as Ethereum and it isn't nearly as popular. It's currently ranked 39th on a list of coins by market cap, as opposed to Ethereum, which is second only to Bitcoin. So this means that the community around Tezos NFTs is much smaller, and therefore the marketplace where you can sell your NFTs is also much smaller. So keep that in mind if you're planning to get started with Tezos. But all that said, the world of crypto is constantly evolving and changing and new technologies are being invented. And it seems that loyalties are fickle. So it could be that the promising aspects of Tezos will cause it to rise in the coming years and we'll see a more widespread adoption in the NFT community and a greater popularity in the future. Let's talk about the future of Tezos for photographers. So when I was looking up Tezos and photography, the one thing that kept coming up was Arago, which is not live yet, but intends to go live very soon, I believe. And Arago is built on Tezos and it is meant to be a digital gallery space for photographers specifically. So it's exclusive to photography, which is really cool that something like that is gonna exist. It's modeled as a digital photography gallery rather than a mass marketplace like OpenSea. Selling an NFT on the platform also involves selling the copyright to that image, which I think is a really interesting aspect having NFTs wrapped up with copyright because it makes the NFT a little bit more intrinsically valuable because you have the printing and publishing rights to that image. So you can make postcards or prints or any way that a photographer could profit off of their image. You as the holder of this NFT can now profit off of that image, which I think 
creates a much more interesting incentive for people to want to buy NFTs in the first place. This seems like it could develop into an interesting alternative to stock photo websites in that it allows users to take a larger share of the sale price of their work. So for example, on Shutterstock, I only make around 10 cents when my photos are downloaded, but if I was selling my photos as NFTs, maybe I could make 10 to $15 per image. I know that that's not really the intended purpose for Arago, but I can see that functionality being a draw for the platform in the future. This means that people have a greater financial incentive to buy NFTs, even if they don't think the NFT itself will ever appreciate in value. And this could wind up helping unseen and underappreciated artists sell their NFTs because the buyer is focused more on the content of the image and how marketable that content is, and not on the value of the NFT and whether or not this artist is ever going to become more famous and therefore the NFT will ever appreciate in value. I like the potential of Arago, uh, but there are a lot of drawbacks to it that I see in what's currently proposed for it. So the creators seem focused on this idea of curation and exclusivity, which is, I guess, a draw for buyers, but a little bit of a drawback for potential sellers. There's also a really steep commission fee of 50% on initial listings and an additional 5% management fee. So that's pretty stupid. I do think that it's kind of lame that a platform that advertises itself as like the first of its kind marketplace for photographers to market their photography on Tezos, proof of stake, all of these cool groundbreaking aspects of it. And then it's trying to imitate traditional fine art gallery spaces, which have all of these problems. And it's carrying all of those problems with it. Arago could be breaking new ground and playing into the decentralized aspect of cryptocurrency, but instead you've got this centralized entity that's taking a 55% cut of all sales on the platform. It really does seem to defeat the purpose of having a decentralized platform in the first place a little bit, but whatever. That said, I do really like the idea of having NFTs wrapped up with copyrights, and I see a lot of interesting potential for that. I think with a few tweaks, Arago or something like it could be a valuable marketplace for photographers and a great alternative to parasitic stock websites like Shutterstock. And I will talk about Shutterstock in a future video because I have gripes. I have gripes. I've talked a lot about some of the benefits of Tezos and proof of stake and it's almost like a, like a positive end to the video so I've got to ruin that by getting back to the crypto skeptic side of things because of course there's a catch. Proof of stake. Problems. <laughs> so. You might have guessed this from when I described proof of stake, but the more money you can deposit into the network or put at stake, the higher your chances are of becoming the next validator. And because the validator of each block is rewarded with all the fees contained inside of that block, the more money you can put in, the higher your chances are of getting money out. <laughs> if that sounds a bit dubious to you, you've got good intuition <laughs> because it is pretty dubious. It creates a situation where the rich can get richer more easily than everyone else. What else is new? <laughs> um, and as the rich get richer, they can then put more money back in and then increase their chances even more. And it creates like this feedback loop. And if I know anything about capitalism, it's that feedback loops that make rich people richer will inevitably concentrate ungodly amounts of wealth and power in the hands of a few hyper wealthy individuals. And that is when we get, you know, yeah, <laughs> so there are solutions to this for proof of stake, like incorporating more random chance. So, you know, even if you've got the highest amount at stake, there's still an element of randomness or weighing odds based on how long nodes have been staking their money rather than on how much of it there is or combining all three of these elements in different ways. But from what I've read, it seems that anything other than true complete random chance will result in power over the validity of the blockchain being concentrated. And whether that's concentrated in the hands of people who got in on it early or people who are already very wealthy or a combination of the two, the concentration of power is kind of the opposite of what blockchain is supposed to be all about. And I think that this could be a major problem if blockchain ever does reach widespread adoption like the crypto enthusiasts really, really want it to. <laughs> And even on Tezos, I mean, the buy-in is thirty to forty thousand dollars, so that's not exactly accessible for your everyday person. And that's the thirty-ninth most popular coin. You can imagine what the buy-ins would be on more popular coins like Ethereum or Bitcoin if they were ever to go to a proof-of-stake system. So it's because of this, you know, even the most promising alternative to proof of work has this really big weird issue. I think that cryptocurrencies in general do have a long way to go before they're ready to make good on what's promised of them. And I think it's going to be a really long time before crypto is as good for the everyday artist as crypto enthusiasts would have you believe. 
So that's everything that I really had to say, uh, mostly. I do have another section here titled Other Dumb Stuff. <laughs> and this is just gonna be a little rant about other dumb stuff that didn't fit nicely into the chapters and sections in this video, but that I wanted to include anyways because it's pretty stupid. So first of all, NFTs are vulnerable to link rot. The image, it's not actually stored in the NFT. It's not actually stored in the blockchain itself. What's in the blockchain is just a link pointing to the location where the image is stored on a server, much like how images are referenced on websites, which means that once that image is gone from the server, the NFT will just point back to a broken link and you'll get a broken link icon like this. <laughs> you know, you've seen this many times, but imagine seeing this on something that you paid $200,000 for. <laughs> It also means that hypothetically, you could hijack that NFT and replace the image with something else. And it, the block would still be valid because the link is still valid. It doesn't have any reference to what's at the link, right? So I could replace your bored ape with like a picture of my middle finger, hypothetically, and there would be very, very little, if anything, that you could do about it. And unless you had control over the server where that image was stored, you definitely wouldn't be able to restore your original image. So that seems like a huge vulnerability and definitely calls into question this idea that when you buy an NFT, you're buying an indelibly inscribed piece of the blockchain. You technically are, but not in the way you think. Another dumb thing is the corporatization of crypto, and I alluded to this briefly in part one, but so many crypto bros like to act like crypto is this super underground anti-establishment workaround to stick it to the man, but Billionaires and large corporations love crypto and especially NFTs and engage with it constantly. Like tons of brands have NFT collections <laughs> available and the corporate bandwagoning onto crypto that I've seen recently really reminds me of how corporations kind of colonized pride celebrations. <laughs> like what began as an underground movement rebelling against authority has become a competition to see whose bank can be the most rainbow in June. And that's really where I see the NFT marketplaces going. Third dumb thing is the MLM culture within NFTs. And I alluded to this briefly, but you should really go and learn more information about it because so many of the psychological tactics employed by crypto bros are identical to those employed within multi-level marketing associations. So much so that I've seen people call crypto MLM lems for men, which ignoring the gendered aspect of that, I do find very funny. If you ever find yourself in a group that polices fear, uncertainty, and doubt, it doesn't let you express concerns, no matter how legitimate those concerns may be, get out, because you're in a cult, a pyramid scheme. Fourth dumb thing, pump and dumps are not only legal within crypto, but they're like most of it. You remember the Wolf of Wall Street, okay? Wall Street financial criminal Jordan Belford loves crypto and he went to jail. He served time for running pump and dump schemes with fiat currency. So of course he would love to employ his speciality in a way that is legal for some reason. <laughs> Just recently a YouTuber got called out for running a pump and dump scheme with this coin that he created, getting all of his fans to buy into it and then selling half a million dollars worth of his coins and buying a Tesla with the money. <laughs> and like, they're calling this a scam, but is it a scam if you can fully see it coming going in? I think if every crypto startup is doing pretty much the exact same thing, are you really getting scammed or are you just like walking right into that one? <laughs> like, I don't know. Fifth dumb thing is that most crypto investment is just a greater fool game. In fact, I would say all because you're buying assets that have no practical or intrinsic value or application in the hopes that a greater fool will come along and buy those assets from you for a greater price. And they're buying those assets from you in the hopes that an even greater fool will come along and buy them from them. But there's no way for those assets to appreciate other than finding a greater fool who's willing to buy them. <laughs> so this is why the term pyramid scheme is thrown around so often when discussing crypto and why I definitely agree it's kind of a pyramid scheme, at least in a lot of applications. Finally, my sixth dumb thing is that billionaires love crypto. Elon Musk is not a good guy. He's not a genius, okay? He's a trust fund baby union busting egomaniac who claims to be an environmentalist and yet has absolutely no problem burning millions of tons of carbon dioxide in his vanity project space race with Bezos. He never invented anything. He used his family's emerald mining tycoon money to buy Tesla and then immediately installed himself as a founder and created this identity for himself as like the real life Tony Stark, but he's not. He's lying to you, just like Zuckerberg is lying to you about not being an alien android hybrid in a meat suit. Zuckerberg is not a good guy. Buffett is not a good guy. And the list of billionaires who are cashing in on crypto is almost as long as the list of billionaires that exist. So if you're really anti-establishment, you should be extremely suspicious of any technology that claims to be all about decentralization and taking power out of the hands of institutions, and yet is backed by the very individuals who corrupted those institutions in the first place. And that's it. <laughs> that's all I have to say about crypto and NFTs. There's more dumb stuff, but I 
I don't have the bandwidth for it and this video is already probably very long. It's taken me like two and a half hours to film. So that's it. Don't worry about it. I'm never gonna talk about crypto again on this channel. That's the end of it. Probably a lie, I'll probably talk about it someday, but not for a long time because I never want to think about it again. Thank you guys so much for watching. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the next minute or so of this video is just gonna be me telling a story. If you're not interested in that, log off now. You've, you've seen all the information. So I actually had to do all of the research for this video twice because I did the first video and this video in the same document. And then I filmed the first video and then I deleted the document <laughs> and it was gone. I looked everywhere on my computer. I was like, oh my God, how did I lose this? Because that document took me like, I don't know, probably 11 to 14 hours to write, and then all of the research and all of the links and the sources and things that I had compiled over the last two weeks were gone. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God. And so I tried to edit the first video to not make any mention of a second video. And I did it fairly well, but then I realized like, there's just, there's still so much that I wanna say. I didn't wanna like leave it at the first video. And so I did put all of the energy in to writing the script again and finding all of the sources again and doing all of the research again and getting all of the information. So I know this stuff very well now. And thankfully the second time, it only took me like, I don't know, four to six hours to rewrite because I remembered so much of it from the first time. But I watched that one two hour long folding ideas video that's like the top source. I watched that three times. <laughs> so I spent six hours watching folding ideas talk about the problem with NFTs. And trust me, I know. <laughs> I know the problem with NFTs, but go watch that video. It's really good. But yeah, I had a time machine backup. It wasn't on my time machine backup. So I guess I had had deleted it a few days prior. And so then I just, I installed some like document recovery software to see if that would get it back. And that didn't work. It found other things that I had deleted in the last few days, but it couldn't find my video script. I even took it into the computer shop and they said that data recovery started at $400. And I authentically had a moment of considering it, <laughs> but I did not fork over the $400. Instead, I spent another four to six hours rewriting this entire script. I actually like it better this time because the initial script didn't include anything about Tezos. That was gonna be in a third video. So this has kind of saved me the effort of doing that third video, I guess. And it is a better script overall. I think it's a bit more cohesive, but oh my God, am I tired of thinking about NFTs. <laughs> like if I never hear the word NFT again, I will be such a happy person. And I know, I know that that will not be the case. <laughs> That's, I know that I'm gonna have to talk about this more in the future and maybe even in the comment section. But anyway, <clears throat> Thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you for staying with me on this NFT journey. I hope that you enjoyed the video. If you did, leave a like, leave a comment. You can even subscribe to my channel. And uh, yeah, I'll be back with a new video next Monday, probably another longer form video, or I might take a break and do something kind of fluffy, but I've got a horror and photography video idea that I want to do soon. So stay tuned for that. <laughs> Thank you guys. That's all for now. Take care, stay sharp, and don't forget to keep shooting. Bye guys.